I'm going to talk about what, I, the way, what I've been working on for the last uh, uh, 25 years or so, which I think is something that uh, nobody else in the world exactly has been trying to do, and which I think is actually important for understanding the political history of the world over the last uh, century and a half or so, and is very, very important in the shaping the political lives of many different countries in the world today. It's, uh, it's what has happened to one particular word, the word democracy. Uh, democracy is an English pronunciation of it, but it's an old Greek word. It uh, was invented, I think, it entered the history of human languages about 2,500 years ago, and it entered the, that history to describe the political arrangements of one particular community, as far as we know. And uh, that community was very, very different from any modern state. Um, and it had very distinctive political arrangements. The word referred to those very distinctive political arrangements. And they were arrangements through which uh, the full citizens of that not very large community actually ruled the community, decided together what the community was going to do, whether it was going to go to war or make peace, what its laws should be. Because it referred to that very distinctive political experience, that word didn't uh, initially uh, mean to people in any other part of the world or in speaking any other language. It didn't mean anything at all. And uh, it survived in the history of world languages, not because of people who admired the political life of that community, but because of the intellectual enemies of, of that way of organizing politics in the community, from the critics of democracy. And it survived in very ambitious and complicated thinking of a very small number of people for the next nearly 2,000 years. And it might have disappeared from the history of the world language. But it came back again very late in the 18th century for a relatively small number of people, but uh, on more and more in the 19th century and much more in the 20th century. And it spread out of uh, the language of um, Greek and then Latin, the Roman conquerors of, of ancient Greece, um, to the languages of any large group of human beings in the world today. And the political enemies of the idea of democracy, um, and there aren't as many open enemies, had to use the same word because the word came, came to refer to big struggles about the shaping of the lives of populations right across the world. In the course of the 20th century, m most large human communities, politically organized human communities, chose to try to describe why they were ruled the way they were through this one word. It's had an, a quite different history from every other word in the history of human speech. It's come to pull together and in a way monopolize the credible basis on which it's possible for people to rule and uh, rule legitimately, to rule with uh, justification. Um, and what I've been trying to understand is the shape of that bit of world history, a very central bit politically of world history. And I've been trying to understand the arguments about why one set of people justified in using the word and entitled to use the word and why the, the word can be used to describe the political institutions through which they're doing so and why th there has been such a struggle to be the rightful users of the word. So that, for example, in the history of the Soviet Union, which is obviously of enormous importance to the people of Armenia, um, it was very important to claim that the Soviet Union was entitled amongst all the um, uh, political communities of the world most entitled to use the word democracy because it was a real system of rule for the people. And the party which was the, was the effective ruler and the top of the party, which still more so was the effective ruler, ruled because they claimed to rule at, 
democratically, to rule for the people and in some sense as the people. It was a ridiculous claim in my view in the case of the Soviet Union and it's a fairly absurd claim in relation to anywhere. It's a very strained claim. But the reason it, it uh, has had this history was because when it was first used to refer to the political arrangements of ancient Athens, it wasn't an absurd claim because it was literally true that the citizens of ancient Athens took the big decisions for their community about what was to happen, about when there was going to be war or peace or when there was going, what the law was going to be. They took those decisions personally themselves, meeting together and arguing with each other. And the results of their arguments were the decisions of their political community. And the claim of every modern democracy is that the, the way in which its uh, ruling structure has decided that on how to rule is decided in the same way or with the same sort of justification. Well, it isn't ever decided in the same way, and so it can't have the same sort of justification. But in every case, the, the pretense is, or the assertion is, that in some way or other, if you look at the political arrangements um, generously, but, but uh, also without uh, lying about the matter, those arrangements really have the same sort of justification and the same sort of trustworthy relation to the balance of the feeling and judgment in the population. Well, that isn't true. And there's no way of organizing the political life of a modern society in which that can be true. But the, the claim that, it, that those arrangements are trying to do the same thing is of very fundamental importance. And the most bitter political disagreements in the history of the world in the last 150 years have more and more turned into disagreements about how far that claim is, has, is reasonable and what sort of justification it has. Now, in the last 70 years or so, um, one particular shape of state has increasingly claimed that it is the shape which can make that claim without absurdity and without lying, and that all other forms of state can't make that claim. As I've tried to say, if you look at this process as a single historical process, and it's been a single historical process, then uh, in a way no, no modern state can really make that claim except as a very, very strained metaphor. It can't be literally true. But you could say the metaphor is much more strained in some cases than it is in other cases. And the big claim which is made, has been made by those sorts of states, of which Armenia in constitutional shape and in self-description through the machinery of the state is an example now, uh, as it definitely wasn't um, when it was part of the Soviet Union. Um, in that sort of state, the justification for saying that the claim is true in some sense is that the governments are chosen through a system in which all the adult citizens freely decide who the government is to be. Now, those decisions are always taken between particular competing sets of um, candidates to be the rulers. And of course, it's true to very varying degrees that the decision about which of those are to be chosen is a free decision. Um, so at one level you have people in very large quantities, uh, or perhaps almost everyone, pretend to take part in the choice and the, the results of the choice being described as 99% of the population. Well, that couldn't be a free choice anywhere ever because people disagree with each other about many things and they don't ever all agree. And they particularly don't all, ever all agree about who it would be really good to have shaping all their lives, whether they like it or not. So if you have a result like that, which you have had 
historically in many uh, parts of the world at various points in time in the last century or so, you can tell at once that must be a fraud. It must be an absurd fraud too. But uh, in states of, of, the sh of the shape constitutionally and formally and legally that Armenia now is, it can't be a fraud of that kind any longer. And the question of how far the, the processes of choice, the choices people make, are really few free choices is a very important political question everywhere. And the basis on which the teams of people who are competing with each other to be the rulers, if there are teams that are permitted to compete, the basis on which they're doing so um, in every country in the world is uh, imperfect as a way of finding out what people would really want um, because it's shaped by uh, the, the resources available to the teams of competing um, candidates for ruling when they start to compete. So it isn't a fair competition really anywhere and probably can't be any longer in the history of a world which is dominated by a, a global capitalist economy. Within that framework, it's not true that these competitions are ever fair and it's not true that the competitions are ever actually competitions um, decided by the, the equal power of all the citizens because actually the citizens have very, very unequal power indeed between one another, as all citizens everywhere know, um, because there are some that are very rich and some that have very great power because of the institutions in which they work and um, and which they to some degree control. So it isn't actually a fair competition or an equal competition anywhere, but it is a competition in quite a lot of countries now in which the citizens are actually free when they decide between these teams. And that is a, a very important fact, and that is really essentially why it is that that particular form is a more um, plausible form uh, and a more attractive form uh, across the world than any other. Uh, there are quite a lot of other forms still out there in the world, and particularly there are still quite a lot of monarchies, and some of them very rich monarchies, but actually a monarchy can't look like a plausible basis for legitimate rule if you look at it from outside the country. It's reasonable to assume, I think, that there won't be any monarchies in a hundred years' time. Um, because the democratic political form just is a much less ridiculous sort of claim than the, a monarchical political form. Um, it's possible, though it's certainly not at all certain, that there won't uh, be any more single party monopoly political forms either in a hundred years' time. And obviously whether there, is, there are or aren't will be principally decided in China because China still has a political form of that kind, exactly like the Soviet Union, obviously imitating the Soviet Union very carefully in that respect, although it's uh, completely abandoned any real uh, intention to build a socialist economy. It's got the sort of ruins of a socialist economy around it, but it has a very dynamic capitalist economy now, very unstable, but very dynamic. It's a very important political question for the countries that have, in a way, gone furthest in the direction of this idea. It's a very important question whether the idea is becoming uh, more convincing and shaping more of the lives of a society or less convincing and shaping, shaping less of the lives of society. And on the whole, uh, my judgment is that in some cultural respects in quite a lot of them. It's shaping a bit more of the lives of society, but in political respects, in terms of the fundamental allocation of life chances between citizens, it's actually shaping on the whole less and less uh, in most places, in the United States, for example, or the United Kingdom, or France, or probably even Germany. So it depends exactly what you're trying to understand uh, in this very confusing but very 
in my view, very strongly connected political space that we are all living in now. If, if you are trying to understand that, um, it, it may be true that in the setting in which you're living, the idea of democracy is somehow or other becoming more, more real, more connectable with features of your lives. Um, but um, in many parts of the world, I think it probably isn't. And in the parts of the world that are most um, conceited about their level of political and civilizational achievement, I would say on the whole that this idea is becoming less and less convincingly related to the political lives of communities and to the economic lives of communities. It's perhaps a little bit more plausible in the sorts of ways in which uh, personal interactions work inside a community. So it's more, it's more convincing culturally than it is politically or economically. And I haven't been trying to do this because I've been trying to guess the human future, not very sensible way of spending one's time because you won't guess it right. But I have been trying uh, throughout, I mean, to understand why it is that the political lives of populations are so consistently disappointing and um, frustrating, and trying to understand what parts of them support the better elements in the um, forward development of human communities and what parts of them actually uh, stop or prevent, I mean, the better directions of development. It is right to try to understand this as a single uh, process, as, as, a, as, as one huge shape that has emerged through the history of the human species over, as I've tried to say, the last two or three hundred years or so, really. But all of it, in a way, referring back to this distant, very distant political experience two and a half thousand years ago, somewhere much smaller and very distinctive. So it's a, it is, a, if you are interested in history, and all human beings should have a little interest in history because they're all shaped by history and they're all inside history. If you're interested in history at all, this is one of the great stories to try to understand about the history of our species from today. And if you're just interested in fighting inside your own life for what could be better or worse with a reasonable number of your fellows at the same time in the same place, then this also is something it's really very important to understand practically in ways that people on the whole don't really understand it at all, I think. So I think what I've been trying to do is, is something which, is, um, which has quite deep implications for everywhere. But it's, um, you have to disappear into the train of thought I've been trying to describe and try to understand the way in which it's held together and the way in which it is one shape if you're going to actually understand it at all well.